We have any disciples of Christ in this place? Okay. If you're a disciple of Christ, you're different than the stereotypical Christian, all right? And this is what you're meant to be. You're meant to be a world changer, all right? You're not intended to come to a building like this, sit in the seats, and walk out of this place the same and not do anything else about it. That, that's religiosity. That's not why we're put upon this earth as disciples of Christ. We are called and we need to be world changers. Amen? Amen. Let's just pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that, number one, you sent your son to come to this earth and die for somebody like me. Uh, Father, I, I consider it an absolute privilege that you would use me and every single person here because each one of us, God, are are, are a cracked pot in some way. But Father, uh, that's what's so amazing about you is you choose to use me and every person here. And I thank you that uh, because of Jesus and his righteousness, God, that's been placed upon me that I have even the opportunity by your grace to, to stand before people and share prophetically what you want to be said. And every single person has the privilege to do that as well. I thank you. I thank you that you didn't just leave us as orphans, but you ascended and sent the Holy Spirit to be within us, within this place, that your manifest presence wants to envelop every single person here. And I pray, God, today that every single person in this place, God, would be changed, transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit. Make every single one of us powerful witnesses for your kingdom and make us world changers, I pray in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. 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 Well, several times a year, um, I uh, try to shift gears a little bit, and uh, today is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we try to look at, uh, to focus a little bit upon missions uh, a couple times a year, and to let you guys know what Lifehouse is doing, and uh, the what's and why's of why we support different missionaries and that kind of thing. And I'll, I'll share uh, an exhortation type message here in just a minute, but before that, I, I want to uh, paint a picture of uh, one area of our, our missions that we support here at Lifehouse Church. Um, as uh, most of you know, the, me and my wife went to Guadalajara, Mexico uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, we went to visit the Met and Brinks. I think I got a picture of them. If you don't know them, um, they're a couple that uh, when they come back here, we'll try to get them here, but you need to get to know them. They are uh, an amazing couple uh, with uh, you see three kids right now there. They're going to have the fourth one coming up here uh, in, in probably about six months. So um, anyway, I just want to let you know before I begin teaching here, I want to kind of paint a picture of, of what, we, uh, what we saw. And the reason why I want to paint this picture is because we're going to go back here in uh, next summer. And uh, I want to take a lot of you along, okay, because there's a lot of work to do there in Guadalajara. So um, with that said, let me just show you a few things of, of what uh, we saw this, this time we were there. Um, Guadalajara is in Mexico. Man, I feel like I'm a missionary right now. <laughs> but uh, Guadalajara is in Mexico, and it's in central Mexico. And uh, it's kind of on the, the eastern side, uh, close to Puerto uh, Vallarta, and I can't say that for some reason, but uh, it's kind of, a, many of you know it as a kind of resort that a lot of people go to. Um, it's about, uh, oh, about an hour, two-hour bus ride uh, from that area, so if you've been to uh, Puerto Vallarta, that's kind of where Guadalajara's at. Um, Guadalajara is uh, a city that's in uh, the state of uh, Jalesco of Mexico, and uh, as you kind of... Uh, get down a little bit closer, you can kind of see there's the state of Jalesco. And the metro area of Guadalajara, there's anywhere from, from what I've seen the reports of, anywhere from 6 million all the way up to 10 million people, depending on how big you want to go out for this metro area, because it's a, a very, very large area. Uh, when we were down there, we kind of traveled all around this, this whole metro area. Um, and, and what I want you to begin to know here. Uh, if you're interested in ever taking a missions trip, and this is a great one to take, number one, because it's only four hours from here and in plane flying time, all right? Now, it, it, it'll take you longer by sitting in an airport with your layovers than it, what it actually takes you to get there. But from, uh, from Omaha or Grand Island uh, to Dallas, it's about a two-hour flight. And from Dallas uh, to Guadalajara, it's, uh, it's another two-hour flight. So literally, you can get on a plane at six in the morning. Uh, if you want to take the early flight, and you can be to Guadalajara uh, by, by noon. So to, to take a missions trip, you don't have to get on an airplane and fly 24 hours over to India or Africa or somewhere like that. You can literally be down in a, a great place to take a missions trip within about four hours. Now, here's what I want you to see is Guadalajara, because uh, I've been asked this many times, um, what's it like? Is it a, is it a 
third world type country. And I want you to know that it's not a third world country because many people think old Mexico is going to be this terrible place and all that kind of stuff. And it's not. Matter of fact, when you fly there, uh, I got a picture. Uh, this is the, what the airport, I believe, looks like. You got that? Obviously, the airport, it's very contemporary. There's a kind of a plane that you'll fly on if you go there. Uh, hey, I got to give you all the details so you know what to, what to expect. But again, uh, it, it's, it's a modern country, but it's a lot different culture, okay? Because you got 9 million people stacked together living on top of each other. And I think that if you went to maybe uh, like a Brooklyn, New York, or somewhere like that, you would probably see some of this in America where people are kind of living on top of each other. When you're from Nebraska, we are literally spoiled because we've got all this land and we all uh, have big yards and all that kind of stuff. That's a pain in the rear end to mow unless, uh, you, like my dad had, came in over and mowed it yesterday, but I appreciate that. But you know what? We, we have this big spread, but these people don't have that. These people literally live kind of on top of each other. But what I want you to understand that if you decide to go there, okay, the culture is different, but it's really not truly a, a third world country. Now, there is parts that are kind of a third world type of atmosphere. So again, here's the kind of the, the good thing about Guadalajara is you can go down there and you're not culture because that can be shocking for people, particularly from Nebraska. Okay, my first mission trip I went on was over to uh, New Delhi and Calcutta, India. There is nothing you can do. When you get there, you are there. Okay, and uh, I blew my ACL out when I was there the first time playing a youth basketball game in, in Calcutta. Spent the next five days sitting in a rat-infested hotel room not be able to move. Okay, what I'm trying to tell you here is if you go to Guadalajara, it's not very far. Okay, and it's a modern city. We will take you into some third world environments, and I think it's very important that People from America see these things of how many, many people of the world live much differently than us because we are absolutely, truly a blessed nation is what we live in. Like my spoiled kids that don't understand what it is not to have a whole house full of toys. All right. But when you get out of that environment, when you get out of this environment and truly see how people live, okay, we really come to the understanding of really how blessed we are. And I tell you what, a lot of times a missions trip is more to change your heart than it is actually to go and help somebody else. I believe that. And I think that everybody should have an opportunity to step out of the environment that we're in uh, into an environment how most people of this world truly live that don't come from a blessed nation like the United States. Now, if you go down there, again, just trying to paint a picture of what you can expect because I want, uh, again, I want people to, to possibly go down there. Okay, um, what's, what's the hotel in the accommodations like? Am I going to be living in a rat-infested hotel like what you just said that I lived in in, 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 in uh, Calcutta? No, this is, uh, this is some pictures of our hotel. Now, in Guadalajara, there are five-star hotels. Matter of fact, they just had the Pan American Games, and there's all these five-star hotels and stuff. Well, we didn't stay in a five-star hotel. We stayed probably in like a, a Motel 8 or something like that, okay? It's like a two-star hotel. The nice thing about where we stayed, though, um, and, and it, was, it was decent. My wife didn't even complain that much, all right? And she, if, if she can stay there, anybody can stay here, okay? Believe me, all right? On our honeymoon, we actually changed hotels like three times because she wasn't satisfied with it, all right? So <laughs> lugging around 15 bags, okay? But uh, anyway, she... She's come a long ways, all right? And she really didn't complain about this whole thing. Wait, go back to the hotel thing. I'm not ready for the, the food picture yet, okay? Um, th the nice thing about this is this is right across the street from where the Met and Brinks live. So again, if you go down there and they're hosting you, um, uh, this is me down in the corner picture. You can see right across the street from where our hotel is. Through that gate right there is where the Met and Brinks live. And it's about a uh, one minute walk away. So if anything was to happen, uh, our missionaries are right there to, to help us out and everything, okay? So again, the, the accommodations aren't bad if you decide to go. Go on to the next one. I'll, I'll get to why we're going down there in a minute. I just got to paint this picture real quick. Okay, um, food. What is the food like? Okay, and again, let me use my wife as an example. If you know my wife, she is a pretty picky eater. All right, she's kind of a, one of those kind of germ freaks, that kind of thing. Well, the food, I thought, was... Fantastic, but I love Mexican food. So you can't judge it off me because, man, I'll sit down and as long as it's spicy and that kind of thing, I'll try these things. And there's some hot peppers down there, believe me, okay? Uh, but, man, I, I enjoyed it. Tacos every night and that kind of thing. And the tacos are a little bit different down there. And what you put in there uh, can be different. Matter of fact, the first night we went there, uh, we showed up at this restaurant. Most of the restaurants are outside. It's kind of cool. And, uh, but uh, they asked me what kind of meat I wanted. And I said, well, I, I want 
beef. And they said, well, you can have all kinds of beef. You can have the, the lips off of a cow. You can have ground uh, up eyeballs. Um, you can have ground up tongue. I said, no thanks, okay? Just give me shredded beef. That's what I want mine. So anyway, uh, the food was good. Uh, my wife what was eating right here. That probably was my least favorite thing to eat, uh, but we tried different things. Uh, El Ranchero that, right here, uh, that was probably my fa favorite place. Paige didn't like it quite so much, so she went back to the hotel and uh, had, uh, had popcorn, okay? So uh, anyway, uh, what, what's next here? Let me give you some, some other pictures here. Um, uh, right here, okay, this is, uh, this is called, uh, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Chili Killies, okay? Chili Killies is a very famous place. Uh, uh, Bono from U2 was just there, and he had his pictures up on the wall and everything, but uh, this is where we ate breakfast, and you eat breakfast. When you eat breakfast, uh, you still eat tacos, okay? So every meal, you're eating some type of tacos, but again, it was good. Uh, the mariachis were there, and, and that's where the mariachis, I think that's what you call them, that's really where that all began. It was in Guadalajara, uh, Tequila, okay? Anybody drink? Nah, just kidding. But uh, we, we were drinking all kinds of tequila. No, we weren't. But uh, tequila was actually, that's where most of tequila is, is made. Jose Cuervo and stuff. And unfortunately from my past life, I know all about that too well. But uh, that's where uh, the tequila comes from and everything. And I tell you that because outside of this restaurant, it uh, had all kinds of tequila bushes and that kind of thing around there. But anyway, um, different places we ate. Matter of fact, uh, if you go down there and you're going, man, I've just just got to get out of this Mexican culture for a while. The great thing about uh, Guadalajara is you can pull yourself out of that culture a little bit. It was my wife's birthday when we were down there, and, uh, and I kind of felt like we needed to go to an American place. So I uh, said, Trent, where can we go? And he said, man, there, there's any type of chain restaurant that you want. So he pulled us out of the Mexican culture, took us back into an American culture. We went to the mall, which was an amazing mall. I mean, you have never seen a mall as is, is nice, exclusive as what this mall was. And uh, we went to Outback and, and ate some steak, you know, and probably, uh, who knows, maybe from Nebraska even. I don't know. But uh, anyway, um, just to let you know that there are, are many uh, conveniences that we have right here in America. If you like Starbucks, there's Starbucks all over that kind of thing. See, guys, I'm trying to paint a picture of this so people, you guys will want to go next time, okay? That there is some, some very good places to go, um, some very modern places to go. Matter of fact, we went to this mall I told you about. Do I get pictures of that? Uh, here's the mall, okay? I mean, they have uh, all kinds of fountains and, and it's, uh, they have a miniature golf course in the middle of it. Uh, they have a live music going on uh, in, in the middle of it. Go to the next picture here. Um, this next picture will show us, I believe, uh, uh, this is, by, this is uh, Pastor Rene from uh, Grand Island. He spoke here before. That's kind of his secondhand man, Noberto, and then the Met Mettenbrinks right here. But if you can see in the back, uh, if you want to know how modern it is, what's in the back there? The Mac store, okay? So, I mean, this, this has really all the modern conveniences of, of really what America has, except, okay, it's a large city that we can take you out of this Americanized thing, put you into a third world environment, and uh, so, so you get uh, the whole gamut of, of truly being on a, a missions trip. Now, the question I get asked quite a bit is, is it safe? If I go down there, am I going to be... Uh, uh, kidnapped by a drug cartel, and, you know, they're going to send my head back in a box or something like that, okay? Uh, chances are, no, that's not going to happen. Matter of fact, the reason why uh, Americans think Mexico is such an uh, unsafe place is because what goes on down around our borders, okay? And that's really where the drug cartels hang out, and uh, every other place, it's really not like that. I've got a couple uh, uh, graphs here to show you. Um, Check out the United States, okay? This is uh, the crime rate, the reported violent crime rate, in, or how many reports have been um, in different countries. Check out where the United States is, and check out where Mexico is. Now, let me just tell you, okay, looking at these statistics, maybe we should decide to go to Mexico just to, to get out of the unsafety place of, of America, right? Because, again, Mexico is, is way down there. How, uh, how safe is Guadalajara? Go to the next one here, compared to other cities. And now this isn't, we got a next slide here? Here we go. Uh, this isn't counting like places in Afghanistan, that kind of stuff, but some cities that you might notice. Guadalajara, the crime rate is about, about equal to Houston or Dallas, Texas. Anybody ever been to Dallas, Texas? Houston? Okay. Did you go down there going, oh, I'm going to get my head cut off going down? You Probably not. Okay. You're not going to get your head cut off, kidnapped or anything like that. It is a big city. And uh, like any big city, there's places that you don't want to walk around at night, 
All right, just like, you know what, there's places probably in Hastings, Nebraska that I probably want to walk around at night. All right, you just got to use your common sense. But again, it is not um, a, a real unsafe place. Matter of fact, the next slide shows you Mexico. The, the black areas are the, the very uh, high crime rates. Okay, and again, it's right up uh, by uh, our borders, uh, and you can see the city up there. You've heard that city on the news. Guys, I wouldn't take you to a city like that. I wouldn't drive through that city probably with a tank, okay? That's why we get on a plane and we fly over that city, okay? And once you fly over it, okay, you can see in the green areas, there's hardly any crime rate in the green areas, okay? That's not where the drug cartels hang out. Okay, Jalesco is in probably one of the lowest crime areas in all of Mexico. The next slide, and I'll bore you with slides here, but you can see Jalesco where I have it circled down at the bottom here. In all of Mexico, it's one of the lowest crime rates in, in the whole state or a whole nation, okay? So again, what I'm telling you guys is uh, if you decide you want to you go, go with this next time, okay, um, accommodations are good. Food is good, only takes you four hours to get there. It doesn't cost very much to get there. It's safe to get there. Plus, uh, we get to help a lot of people. Now, let me just kind of go into that. And I just, before I, I get into really what I want to share with you, I, I want you to understand why it's important for us to go there. Guadalajara um, and really all of Mexico um, is a very, very religious um, a nation, okay? And it's a Roman Catholic. Um, the city of Guadalajara, the metro area, has about 10, 9 to 10 million people. And uh, from what Trent's told me and from statistics that uh, I've looked at, um, out of the 9 to 10 million people, about 5% of them are Protestant people, okay, Protestant churchgoers, all right? Now, we all know that just because you're Protestant doesn't mean that you're a true disciple of Christ, spirit-filled, having the power, the witness uh, power to go out and be a world changer, okay? Uh, there are still, in the Protestant realm, there are still a lot of churches that are very, very religious to where people come and sit in the pews and uh, they don't, uh, th there's no change uh, going on in their life. That's not what this world needs. This world needs true disciples of Christ that are part of a life-giving church that have the opportunity that you, or you would have the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit, transformed with the Holy Spirit, be empowered with the Holy Spirit so that you can go out and be world changers. Now, churches like that in Mexico make up about 2% of this 9 to 10 million people. And that's what we're all about, okay? That's what the Met and Brinks are all about. What we're trying to do down there is trying to, to support, build uh, a network of new pastors that want to go out and plant churches that are spirit-filled churches that are training people up to, uh, to minister in the, the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? And that's what we're trying to do. Trent has uh, anywhere from about uh, 10 to 15 people. He's been there a year, already has 10 to 15 church planters that are going out and planting churches in these neighborhoods that there's no evangelical churches hardly around uh, that people can start to come in and truly experience what God wants, and that's the presence of the Holy Spirit in their very lives. So that's what we're supporting. We're supporting these church planners, trending them up. We're supporting building new churches. We're supporting even the existing churches that are there right now to build those churches up so that they can have a greater influence in, in what needs to happen down in Guadalajara and what needs to happen throughout the whole world. Now, when we went down there, uh, what me and Rennie did is uh, we, uh, we spoke. Uh, they got some pictures up here. That's what I'm turning around looking here. Uh, Oh, well, that's, that's a picture of uh, the cathedral. Um, I was just trying to show you. This, this is what, um, this is downtown, and this is where a lot of people go to, to be religious. And I say that in this way, that a lot of times, Jesus Christ really is secondary. Okay, and I'm not saying that about all Catholic religions, because uh, honestly, I don't know, but I know from being down there, Jesus really is secondary, and they go into these cathedrals, and they pray to all these different type of saints, and they put money in this, this little bucket, and, uh, or this, this thing like what we have, these uh, offering containers, and they think that that's how they're going to be blessed. So if they need a healing, they go to this saint, and they pray to this saint. If they need prosperity, they come over here to this station, they pray to this station, or whatever. So this is kind of what's going on. Now go to the next one. This is what uh, 
See what, yeah, this is uh, what me and Rennie did when we were down there. We spoke to the Bible schools and to the district offices. This is me speaking. Rene's uh, being the translator. That was really a pain in the rear end, but uh, I don't know um, uh, Spanish at all. So uh, anyway, who knows? Maybe next time I'll know a little bit more. Uh, this is him speaking at one of the district things. But the reason that we want to take a group to go down there next time isn't so much to speak, but again, we want to see if there's anybody here that will go down there to help us, number one, do like children's crusades, that kind of thing. But if there's anybody here that likes to do construction, uh, uh, knows electrical, plumbing, um, or can just go and paint and clean up things. We have some facilities that uh, we want to help with uh, to help um, support the, the, the Bible schools and to support uh, these new church plants that are going on. Uh, these are some of the buildings that uh, we need to go down there and work on. Matter of fact, this is the building that I spoke at. Uh, this is... Uh, let me just take a little bunny trail here. You see this building? Would you say that that building looked pretty, looked pretty nice? Hello? Does that look like a pretty nice building? Okay, it, it's really not. And it's not, believe me. When I was down there, you know what the nicest church building that I saw down there was? It was a Mormon church building. And I just looked at this going, this is the kind of stuff that Christians have to go to. But yet... The Mormons are building these great churches. And you know why? Because when you're a Mormon, you're forced to, to contribute to stuff like this so that they have all this wealth. Matter of fact, I just did a whole study on Mormonism. It's amazing that the wealth that Mormons have because they force people that are Mormons to give a portion of, of what they need to give. And they're literally going throughout the world sp spreading this cultish behavior, these ideas upon people because they have the resources to do it. In Christianity, we don't force anybody to give. Okay, what we do is say, hey, look at the biblical truth. And biblical truth is this, that when we give our portion that God wants to the local church, and if people would all do that and give their portion to the local church, we would be unstoppable. But because we don't, and I'm not trying to put guilt trip just on you guys, because this church has generally been a pretty giving church. But when the church as a whole don't give, this is the kind of stuff that, that Christians have to, have to go serve in. And I don't know about you, but my God, um, he, deserves, he deserves everything. When people go into a Christian church, okay, it should be a refuge. It shouldn't be a place where it's falling apart and there's graffiti, there's no chairs, that kind of stuff. We should be as a church, and again, I'm not just looking at you guys, but I'm saying the church as a whole should be so generous in our giving, supporting the cause of spirituality spreading the truth around the world that, that this shouldn't happen. We should have great facilities in order to take care of people. Amen? Well, this is what we want to do. We want to go and fix places like this up. Uh, go to the next one. Uh, this, is, this is actually the nicest church, and you look and go, that's a pretty nice church, and it was. It's a pretty decent church, okay? Go to the next one. Okay, this is, uh, see these white chairs? You guys have been given to this in the last uh, uh, two weeks or whatever. These are the kind of chairs that uh, will go in that church. And like I said, we needed about three, $400 to put chairs in a church because people were sitting on the ground. And this is the kind of church that, uh, that uh, is in Mexico. Uh, the next one, now, this is pretty amazing, this next one. This is actually the, the church that I just showed you a picture of. This is the church right here. What you see up here is this pastor that has very little resources. Okay, he uh, has this great vision to have a homeless shelter and a teen challenge. And that's what you got, you're looking at here. The bottom floor is a homeless shelter. The top floor is a brand new teen challenge that another missionary has gone out and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to put that whole thing there. But again, this is the kind of thing that People are sacrificing for over there in order to, to spread the gospel that we're trying to help with. Uh, this is the type of neighborhood that uh, this is in that you would see if you're there. Okay, this is where you, if you went on this mission trip, you're going to see third world neighborhoods like this. The church is actually just on this side of the whole thing. And then the next, uh, next picture is the project that um, I would like to take a group of, of people down there to construct. This is an old, actually, Assembly of God di district office. Uh, was vacated. Uh, people moved into that uh, that were homeless and basically trashed the whole place. And what they would like to do, what Trent would like to do, is to take this thing over and remodel it, uh, clean up all the trash. You can see the great trash heap and stuff there. The whole thing is just filled with stuff like that. But he wants to take this thing over and make this into the new Bible school that's training up uh, training uh, pastors to plant churches. And there's also a big auditorium inside of that building that uh, they can 
they can begin to have services and that kind of thing in there. So again, if you're interested in helping out with, uh, with some, a project like this, um, we'll be giving you more information about this. And uh, if you have more questions about the missions in Guadalajara, um, uh, this is the kind of stuff that we're going to be doing. But talk to me about it. Okay, um, about done here. Um, the fact is this, again, guys, get the picture. The neighborhoods in Guadalajara are 50 to 60,000 people just in one neighborhood. They're living on top of each other. Okay, what you have is churches in this area that uh, there might be one evangelical church within 50 to 60,000 people. Okay, so you take the size of the city of Hastings, you double it, maybe even triple it, and there's one church that is an evangelical church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit that, that has to minister to all those people. And that's what we're trying to, to build is more and more churches to go into these neighborhoods in order to give people the opportunity to have the power of the Holy Spirit come within them. Uh, this right here, you can't see this very well because this picture is kind of fuzzy, but the guy in the red shirt right there, the, I want to tell you about this, and then I'm going to move on here. This is the son right here, and uh, I believe this is Pastor Manuel. Is that right, Paige? Oh, is this that Roberto? Okay, uh, there's too many Spanish names going on. This is Pastor Roberto. And uh, Pastor Roberto um, pastors that church I just showed you. He has a huge vision for this teen challenge, this homeless shelter, this church. He probably has 7,500 people maybe coming to this church in a neighborhood of 40, 50, 60,000 people. Okay, and here's what I want you to know about this. This pastor shepherds this church, does all these things, uh, homeless shelter, teen challenge, that kind of thing. He makes $350 a month. That's what he makes. And in order to continue to support this ministry here to a neighborhood of 50 to 60,000 people, he has to get up at 2, 3 in the morning, every single morning, drive down, two-hour drive to the middle of Guadalajara, pick up newspapers, drive all the way back, and deliver newspapers in order to support his family, in order to continue to help the church survive. Uh, because, again, there's, there's, there's just poverty around this area. And, and here's my question for you as we begin to get on to what this whole topic is really about, okay? This guy, Roberto, okay, he is a very, very professional guy, okay? If he was here in America, he would have a professional job, okay? He dresses well, he speaks well, he is a professional person. I guarantee you, he could leave this environment, this poverty-stricken environment, he could go and he could find a much better job, he could support his family in greater ways. He's a very professional guy. And the question for you is, what would cause a person like that to live in this third world neighborhood where he barely has enough money to, to feed his own family, let alone pastor a church, run a teen challenge, and, and run a homeless shelter? What would cause somebody to, to want to live a life like that? And here is my challenge to you, because the only reason that somebody would ever do that is because they are pursuing a God-given vision that he has placed within their life, and this God-given vision has, has bound them, has arrested them. That's the only thing that would probably keep somebody there doing that, that he's looking, saying, somehow, some way, I am going to shape a life one person at a time, and one person at a time, I'm going to change this world and this neighborhood. That's why he stays and does that. And here's the challenge to this church today. God wants the same thing out of every single one of you. You're going to move to Guadalajara? No, 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 I'm not saying to move to Guadalajara. But what I'm saying is what God wants from every single person here. And God wants to give you, he wants to give you a unique vision. Every single person here, God has a unique vision for your life. Because if he didn't, when you were saved, he would just take you to heaven. He's left you upon this earth for a reason. He has given everybody a unique vision. And here's what God wants. God wants every single person here to seek out, to search out the heavenly vision, to pursue it. And even though the price is going to be very, very high, and it will, to be a world changer, the price is going to be high, high, the sacrifice is going to be great, but God wants you to seek out that vision. He wants you to carry out that plan, no matter what the price is. Oh, it's quiet in this place. Chris talked about this last week. He said, you know what, there is a difference between, unfortunately, between a Christian and a disciple nowadays. It wasn't back when it first started. A Christian, when, they, when it was first brought to the world was, well, they're acting just like Christ. We'll call them Christians. 
That ain't the case anymore. Matter of fact, I even hate to label somebody as a Christian anymore because the fact is that Christianity has been so watered down. It's just the, the label, stereotypical, stereotypical definition of what a Christian is today is, I think it has to do with our nationality anymore. Oh, he's an American. He must be a Christian. A disciple of Christ, God has called every single one of us to a greater level of action. God wants a higher level of action, just like what we see modeled as a disciple of Christ in, in the Word of God. You know what the disciples did in the Word of God? A true disciple, what they did, what made them a disciple is they were looking at the rabbi, and I've talked about this before, they were looking at the rabbi saying, I'm going to be exactly like him. And who was our rabbi? Jesus Christ. How did Jesus Christ live? Jesus Christ got up every morning probably and sought out the will of the Father, say, Father, it's not my will, but let your will be done, and I'm going to carry out your will, your vision, Father, to the extent that I will probably die for this vision. And he looked at the disciples and said, are you going to be that way too? And we, knew, we know in, in several of the contexts that a lot of them said, see you later. But he looked at the true disciples and said, are you leaving too? And they said, no, where are we going to go? We are going to follow you. We're going to become just like you. And we are going to, we are going to seek after that God-given vision just like you, Jesus. See, church, as disciples of Christ, you are called to be a world changer truly. That's what you are called to do. A true disciple of Christ is a world changer. But in order to be a world changer, we have got to step up the risk level of what we have been doing in the past. And again, please don't think that I'm just picking on this church at all. I'm picking on the worldwide Christian church that we need to pick up the, re the level of risk in our lives. We need to be willing to, to sacrifice great. We need to be willing to step into the zone of the unknown, I call it to get out of our comfort level and capture that God-given vision that he wants to place upon every single one of you. Every one of you has a unique vision that God has for your very life. Paul, he was very effective in changing his world in that time because he pursued the vision of God in this way. Even if it meant death, he would pursue after it. We see this in Acts chapter 20. Paul plants a church at Ephesus and the church is going great. I mean, he's loving the people and church is growing, that kind of thing. And then God stops him right in the middle of this church plant and says, stop, I'm giving you a new vision. I'm doing something new in your life and I'm sending you to Jerusalem. Now again, it's tough for Paul. He loves this church. He loves these people. But he gets caught up in this vision that God places upon him. Matter of fact, the context of Acts chapter 20, verse 22 says this. Right after God says, you're going to Jerusalem, Paul says this, he says, and now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. That's where every single one of us need to be. We need to seek after the vision of God and be arrested is another translation. Have you ever been arrested by a vision of God that you can't get away from? The reason that you're sitting in a church like this today is because six, seven years ago, I was arrested by a vision of God to plant a church. And I'll tell you what, I tried to get away from it took me three years of begging God, you know what, I don't want to do this. Just let me be a business guy. Let me be a Christian. Sitting in the pew, okay, and you know what, if the pastor needs help, I'll help and that kind of stuff, but I don't want to do this, God. But again, I was bound by a vision that, you know what, I'm calling you to do this, and I'm not going to leave you alone until you're going to do this. And this is what Paul's saying here. He says, and now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem, and I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lies ahead. How would you like that vision to come upon you? Eric, I'm sending you somewhere, but you know what? You're going to be thrown in jail. What if the Holy Spirit said that to you? You'd be going, oh, thanks a lot, man. <laughs> that would kind of put a little damper on the excitement that you have. But this is what the Holy Spirit told Paul. It says, you're going to go to Jerusalem and you're going to be persecuted. Verse 24, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for the finishing, for finishing the work or the vision assigned me by Lord Jesus. And what was the vision? That the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God in Jerusalem. This gripped him. He couldn't get away from it. And this is the defining moment that Paul had. And this is the defining moment that you would have to have as well when you seek after a vision of God. 
When he lays something upon your heart, he laid this vision upon his heart, and he had two options to do. He could either say, you know what? I'm in my, my realm of comfort. I'm planning this church, God. I'm not out of your will. I mean, people are still getting saved, and, but I love this church. I'm not going to run off to Jerusalem. He could have done that and disobeyed the heavenly vision. Or he could have looked at God and says, you know what? I am going to get out of my comfort zone into the realm of the unknown. And God, I'm going to obey the vision, the heavenly vision that you laid upon my life, no matter what the cost is. This is what a true disciple of Christ does. A true disciple of Christ doesn't just get comfortable just coming to church on a Sunday morning or whatever, but a true disciple of Christ looks and seeks after the vision of God and says, you know what, whatever it is, I will choose to obey the heavenly vision. I don't, I don't care how tough it's going to be, but I'm going to move out of my comfort level into the, the realm of the unknown, and God, I'm going, to, I'm going to pursue your vision no matter what. This is what a world changer does. This is what a disciple of Christ does. And that's what Paul says. He looks at God or speaks to God after he sees this vision, and he answers God with a very powerful three-letter word that every one of us needs to know when God asks us to do something, and that is the word Y-E-S, yes. I will go, and Paul looks at or speaks to God and says, listen, if your vision is for me to leave Ephesus and go to Jerusalem, God, you know, I'll sacrifice everything to do it. And yes, I will go. And that's what God is looking for through every single one of us. Because he wants to challenge you. He wants to get you out of your comfort zone. Because the fact is this, God will use you in great ways when you aren't doing it. When you're controlling your whole life, are you really being used by the Holy Spirit? But when you choose to step out of the comforts that you have surrounded yourself with, step into the, the zone of the unknown, saying, God, if you don't do it here, it's not going to get done. I do this every single Sunday as I'm doing right now. God, you better work through me because I'll tell you what, if I'm going to stand up there. I'm going to flop unless you show up. And all of us, need to step out of our comfort zone into the realm of the unknown and God will begin to use us and say, God, I will go whatever you put within my heart, whatever vision you, you bound me with, God, I'm not going to disobey that heavenly vision. And Paul speaks here in Acts 20, verse 36. And listen how tough it is when God places a vision on you, but he didn't stop. He resigns from the church in Ephesus and he says, and when he had finished speaking. He knelt and prayed with them, and they all cried in the embrace, and they kissed him goodbye. Okay, it wasn't like a big joyful thing going, yes, I get to leave Ephesus. It was very, very difficult for him. He was giving up friendships that he would probably never see again. He begins this missionary journey going to Jerusalem. He runs into other Christians, people that have prophetic gifts upon them, and he, they come to, to Paul, and they say, Paul, you're going to Jerusalem, I heard. You can't go there. Do you know what's going on in Jerusalem? They are literally tying people up and they're beating people and they're throwing them in jail and they're, Paul, they're killing people down there. You are too important to the growth of the, the kingdom to go to Jerusalem. He said, you don't understand. It's a vision. I've got to go. And, and one of the prophets actually looks at Paul and says, give me your belt. No, you don't need to give me your belt, Eric. But he looked at your Paul and says, give me your belt. And Paul's probably going, what are you talking about? Give me your belt. He says, give me your belt. And Paul's like, okay. You know, he pulls his belt off and says, here you go. And the guy literally lays on the ground, ties his legs up. You know, horse ties his legs and everything like a, like a rodeo cowboy. And he says, look, Paul, if you're, my words aren't getting through to you, let this paint a picture in your mind. This will be what you're going to look like the second you enter the city limits. You are going to be bound. They're going to throw you in a dungeon. They are probably going to cut your head off and kill you, Paul. Don't you understand? Use your head, Paul. You are not going to Jerusalem. Paul said, you know what? I don't think you understand. There has been given a new vision to me. And this new vision is that I am going to go to Jerusalem. And the fact is this everybody. I don't know what they're going to do to me there, except I'm going to be thrown in prison. I don't know if they're going to kill me, but I'll tell you what, if I go, somehow, some way, God is going to make me a world changer. Because that's the heavenly vision. And I don't care what's going to happen. I don't care if I'm even going to die. 
but I'm going to continue to pursue that heavenly vision. That's where every single one of us needs to come to that point to where God just lay that heavenly vision upon me and I will obey it no matter what. Acts 21, Paul answers them when they're saying, you can't go. And he says, what do you mean by all this weeping and breaking, uh, breaking my heart? They're all crying saying, don't go, Paul, you can't go. And he says, what are you doing? And this is what he says, he says, for I am not ready only to be bound, but I will die for this heavenly vision at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He says, so when he would not be persuaded, and here's also another thing you need to understand. When God downloads a heavenly vision, a scary, big, hairy, audacious vision upon your life, people are going to come up to you and go, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this. That's ridiculous. That's never going to work. And we've got to all come to the point where we look and say, you know what? I'm going to obey the heavenly vision and not some person that's trying to talk me out of it. Because there are vision killers everywhere. And they will kill that heavenly vision. And we got to be like Paul, willing to look at everybody else and say, you know what? I'm not going to be persuaded. God has spoken to me, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to accomplish the heavenly vision no matter what people say. And that's what Paul's saying here. I'm not going to be persuaded. And we see saying, the will of the, God, the Lord be done. See, this is the type of commitment, everybody that we, as disciples of Christ, we have got to have. We've got to receive the vision, and no matter what the calling is, nobody is going to persuade us that we would rather die than give up on the vision that God has placed within our life. The fact is that in order for us to be world changers, change agents of this world, that is the type of commitment that we're going to have to have. The commitment of, of the, the Christian church in the last decade or whatever, God, is, if we want to be world changers, we've got to change the level of our commitment. When you look at the past history of world changers upon this world, and not just Christian ones, but, but people that have made a difference in our world, we look at people like in our country, Abraham Lincoln. He died for his cause in order to unite this country. We look at people like, like Gandhi. He died in order to, to get the freedom of India. We look at people like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Okay? He died okay, to bring racial uh, unity within, uh, or racial equality within America. I mean, he died for it. And we know that our Savior, Jesus Christ, he literally died for the cause to set every single one of us free. And this is a commitment that world changers have to have. Now listen, all of them were gifted speakers. All of them were gifted leaders. But the reason why they made such a difference is because they took ownership of the vision that God had placed within them, that something has to be done. They looked at something in this world and said, this is wrong and I am going to change something and I don't care what's going to happen. I will die to make sure this takes place. That is why they changed the world. And listen, if any one of us has that type of commitment for our cause, the world has got to stop and take a look. They can't turn their backs on somebody that says, you know what? I'm going to die to make sure this is going to happen. I don't care what you're going to do. You can try to kill me, but I am, my, my last breath, I'm still going to try to make this cause take place. What are you going to do with somebody like that? I mean, Paul, walking upon this earth, I said, we're going to kill you, Paul. I said, I don't care. I'm already dead, number one. He said, Kill me, please. Absent from the body, he's present with the Lord. What are you going to do with a guy like that? I am going to die for this cause, for this vision. That's what a world changer will do. And for this world to be transformed, for Christ, like we are called to do, we've got to be willing to give it all away in order to make this happen. That's the type of urgency that we, as disciples of Christ, have got to have. Now you're probably sitting in your seats going, whoa. This is making me a little comfortable, Brad. I'm coming to this church because I want to be encouraged. I want to be built up. And here you're talking about dying? You've got to be kidding me. Why all the urgency to, to die for a vision, that kind of stuff? And let me just challenge you to take a look at the condition of the world for a minute. We all know this growing religion called Islam. And it is growing. And the, what's behind this religion I'll tell you what, is to rule you, to take control over you. That's really the basis of it, is the world control is really what it's about. And guess what? They are so committed to their cause, are they willing to die for it? 
Man, these guys are so willing to die for their ideologies that they strap bombs to their, their bodies. And go out and say, you know what? For the cause of Islam, I'm going to blow myself up. And because of that, that's one of the main reasons that this world religion is spreading because the world can't turn their back on it and say, oh, it's just, just them. I just wonder if that's why the world is kind of turning their back on Christianity. Do we have that same type of commitment? Now, I'm not saying that God wants you to strap bombs on you and, and, and give your life from a jihad at all. But you know what? God still wants his disciples to sacrifice it all to serve his vision of love, of compassion, of serving others of telling others about Jesus Christ. No matter what, we are going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with every single person that we can see. And I don't care the cost. Whether it's going to neighborhoods of Guadalajara or just walking across the street to your neighbor. And you know what? I'm convicted about that as well. I'm not talking down to you guys. I'm talking to myself as well. But it's going to take that type of commitment that we can change this world. Now, let me just show you and, and just paint a picture of the urgency we have here. Show, show a couple of these things. Tell me if these pictures bother you. Little kids holding automatic weapons. Little kids right here holding pistols that people said. I mean, what in the world is this little kid doing here with a rocket-propelled pr- grenade right here? Go to the next one here. Does this bother you at all? Does this bother you where this guy's celebrating his little son holding a knife? And if that doesn't bother you, this should really bother you because this this messes me up. Here is probably a two-year-old. By the way, you know what a green bandana is in Islam? That's a sign of a martyr. That's a suicide bomber bandana. He's got an automatic weapon strapped to him. He's got this bomber flak jacket strapped to him. Does that bother you at all? This is, this is where the condition of where our world is going. Now, let me just challenge you. Leave that picture up, everybody, whoever's running that back there. Let me just ask you a question. And the trajectory of, of where this little kid is going right here, do you think he's going to grow up to be a model citizen? From the time he's born, he's been taught this ideologies of killing people, of violence, of murder, killing the infidels, all this kind of stuff. Is this the type of kid that when he grows up that you're going to want him to be the next-door neighbor to your family? Quiet in this place. I'm taking that as a no. But we've got a neighbor right next door to us that when we leave and we get a Walmart or something, we can look at them and say, hey, would you watch your kids for half an hour or something like that? No problem. They do the same thing to us. This guy was living next to you when he gets older. Are you going to do that? This kid is not going to grow up to be a model citizen. He's not going to grow up to be a kid that is going to add to peace upon this world. He's not going to grow up to be a happy, fulfilled person. He's not going to grow up that when he has kids, he's going to probably have new generations of kids that are going to know Jesus Christ, that are going to be fulfilled. This is the type of kid that's never going to grow up. He's probably never going to know who the true God really is. Now let me ask you a question. What's going to change the trajectory of that kid? Is it going to be the massive military that the United States has built up? Is that going to change this kid? I mean, we've seen this in Iraq. We've seen this in Afghanistan. We've seen this in Egypt. We've seen this in Libya. We're seeing this in Syria right now. Is that going to change the ideologies of of this type of kid? Is it going to change that he's on this trajectory going this way? Is it going to deflect the trajectory and, and have him go a whole different direction? Is maybe passing some new international laws or something like that, is that going to change the trajectory of this kid like we're trying to do in Syria? That, you know what, take away their their weapons of, of, you know, mass destruction, that kind of thing. Is that really going to change them? Is maybe some new technology or some maybe new iPhone app or something like that, is that going to change the world? How about academics? I just sent him to college. Is that going to change your life? Here is the question for every disciple here. What has the power only to change somebody's ideologies? The only thing that's going to ever change the heart and the trajectory of where this world is going is many Christ-filled, Holy Spirit-filled disciples of Christ with passion that would choose to intersect where these, the trajectory that these kids are going 
and have the guts to stand up and say, you know what, there is a God that loves you so much that he's laid down his life for you and the power that he will fill you with has the power to evaporate all the hate, all the love out of your very heart. Somebody has to stand up and tell these kids that. And it's going to take a fired up disciple of Christ to go into all the world to be the light of the world, whether again it be Guadalajara, whether it be somewhere in the Middle East, or again, whether it's walking across the street when you see the darkness in your neighborhood and telling people, you know what, there is a God that truly loves you. Somebody's got to start to do that. So again, please hear me, church. If you hold the message of Jesus Christ, you hold a message of great power, but you also hold the message of great, great responsibility. Because the message of Jesus Christ is the only power that can change a heart of love to a heart, or a heart of hatred to a heart of love. You have that power, but you also have that responsibility. You are the transforming agents of the world that God has given you the plan. And here's the alarming fact is, guys, that there is no plan B. Why God placed the entire world upon our hands, I don't know. But he has, and there's no plan B for it. Either we get it done, or this isn't going to happen. And the darkness is going to continue to, to, to go upon the world. Because again, nobody or nothing else is going to take your place. Again, why is it so critical to stay focused? Why is it so critical to move forward in the midst of probably persecution and all that kind of stuff? Why is it so critical that we start new churches and continue to pour fuel on the fire to existing churches? Because again, you are the light of the world. And if the local church doesn't overcome the darkness, it ain't going to get done. And I hate to make it so clear to put responsibility on every single person here. But the world's condition, the balance of the world, hangs upon how we act in this world. And if we are just regular so-called Christians that sit in the seats and don't ever do anything, the darkness is going to overcome this world. But if we truly are disciples of Christ to where we are filled with the Holy Spirit with power and we go into all the world, whatever the cost is, and say, God, I see the vision that you're calling me to and I'm not backing down, oh God. The light is going to dissipate that darkness. Listen, you're not here by accident. If you're sitting in this place, okay, unless somebody paid you to come or something like this, I believe that the Holy Spirit has a reason why you're here. At some point in your life, God has called you to seek out his spirit, his will for your life, or you wouldn't be sitting in a church right now. That there's something inside of you that wants to redeem this this maximum potential of, of being a disciple of Christ. I don't know about you, but you know, maybe, maybe there's something that has happened in your life, like in my life, okay, that has kind of dissipated. Maybe, maybe, maybe your life has taken you in a different direction. You're like, you know what? I just need to rest. I just need to coast for a while. I just need to sit in the seats for a while. Listen, church, we cannot afford to do this anymore. This is what Paul said. I'm about ready to close here. Romans 12, 6, he says this. He says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us, each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. He's saying, don't you back down. If you have the, the gift to speak boldly, he says, don't you dare back down. He goes on here and he says, in accordance to your faith, if it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. Don't take time off, but teach. Find somebody to teach. Disciple somebody. If it's to encourage, find somebody that's depressed and, and lavish your love upon them. Encourage them. Don't back down from that. He says, if it's giving, then give generously. Don't back away from giving because, again, the hope of the world is in your hands. And he says, if it's to lead, then you lead with all diligence. Diligence means that you lead with haste, that you don't delay. I think every single person here, God has ordained you to lead somewhere in this world. And he says, if that's the case, then you lead with all diligence. And again, you don't back down because again, the world is hanging in the balance of what you do because you have the message of Jesus Christ. 
So we must get up every day and strive that, you know what, I am going to do everything I can to make a difference in my life for Jesus Christ. God has given every single person here a unique vision. And he would say to you, don't you dare back down. Matter of fact, Scripture says that several times. I will not be, what did I say, uh, I won't be pleased. He says, I will not be pleased if you shrink back. If you're given a gift, don't you dare shrink back. Because it's going to take a God-inspired disciple of Christ that has the ability by the grace given to you to be agents of life, light to this world. What would happen here if every person here, including me, I put myself in your category as well, I'm just the messenger here, if we would truly grip this as Paul did and God laid down that vision upon us and we said, no matter what, God, I am going to accomplish that, what would happen to this world? What would happen if if every life-giving church took this seriously? We would overcome the darkness of this world and light would shine everywhere. The darkness would dissipate. Worship team, if you want to come on up. See, when the world is filled with so many vibrant churches, this you know what I believe? I believe we're going to see a renewal of Acts chapter 2. You know what? Jesus said, you know what? He said in, in Matthew 16, 18, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he looked at all the disciples and he says, are you going to join me? I'm going to build my church, but I need you to, to partner with me. Will you partner with me? And you know what? We're not living back when Jesus walked upon this earth. We're living now when the Spirit of God is here right now with us. And this is what I believe. The Spirit of God is still saying the same thing, and he's tapping every single person here on the shoulder. He's saying, Eric, saying, Pat, saying, Jeff, Tammy. He's tapping you on the shoulder saying, I'm building my church. Will you partner with me? Will you reaffirm your dedication to helping me build this church And when we look at the condition of the world, let me just ask you, how in the world could you ever say no? How could you look at that challenge as the Holy Spirit's tapping you on the shoulder, saying you're the only way, you're the only way it's gonna get done. And to look back at him and say, you know what? Spirit, I know that you're building your church. And I know that this is the only way, but you know what? I'm building my realm of comfort right now. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to rob from giving you the primary time, talents, and treasures that I have because I'm too busy building mine. So God, you go ahead and you build your church because I'm building my comfort zone over here. As the world is falling apart, how could anybody look at God as he's tapping you on the shoulder and say, no, I can't do that? Again, we're at a point of world history that we can't sit back anymore because the darkness is coming to an area near you. God is including every single person here in his grand scheme. He has a unique vision for you. We sang a song earlier about this amazing God. And if that is not amazing, I don't know what is. That he could take a cracked pot like me and every single one of you, and we are, and still say, you know what? I want to use every single person here. It's the God of all of heaven and earth that is calling you to partner with him. And again, as a leader needs to do, I guess I'm looking at you right now and saying, are you in or are you out? If every person here would do this, say, God, I'm giving you the primary assets of my life. Acts chapter two is gonna happen. We're going to see signs, wonders, miracles take place. We're going to see every life-giving church full daily as what we saw in Acts chapter 2. And the world is going to dissipate from the darkness that we see right now. But again, to make this all happen, it's going to take an effort from every person here to strive after the vision of God and truly become a world changer. Stand up with me as we close. I haven't shared for two weeks, so that's why I'm going long. But in all reality here, everyone, the question's to you right now. I believe the Holy Spirit's calling you to up the level of risk in your life and to become a world changer. And the question that he has for you this very day is, are you in or are you out? Are you giving him the primary gifts or are you just saying, no, I'm using them for myself. I'll give you maybe a little leftovers, God. Here's a bone for you. 
He's asking you that you step up and you be a world changer. That's what a disciple of Christ is. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, that you're a God that uses people like me, that you use people like every single person sitting here. What a privilege it is that the God of this universe would even think about using somebody like me. But you have, and that's what makes you so amazing. And God, I pray that every single person here would seek after the vision that you have for them and not hold back, oh God. That they would not shrink back. Because again, the balance of the world hangs in what your disciples do. Father, give us passion, compassion, to see this world from your eyes, from your standpoint. And right now, God, I just pray the Holy Spirit, that you begin to lay vision upon every single person here. As we get ready to close here and as we begin to sing, there's really three parts to this service. That we sing, we worship, yeah, we get the word, but there's also a ministry part. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. And I'm gonna ask you today, if you want God to begin to download vision in your life, and he has a unique one for every single person here, I'm going to ask that, that you just come up here. I don't care if it's 10 after 12. Who cares? God wants to lay a vision to make you a world changer. I'm going to ask you just come up here and let's pray. Pray with somebody. We'll have some of our prayer team elders up here and everything. And when we start to sing, come down here and let's pray that God would begin to give you a vision. Who knows? That's just the start of it. Maybe you need to go to Guadalajara or somewhere like that, that God would take you out of your comfort zone and show you what he wants to do but it starts right here with us praying, seeking after God, saying, God, give us something that's gonna help me change this world. So Father, I pray that that would begin to happen right now. Holy Spirit, begin to speak to people. Bring them to the place, God, of seeking after you today. Let them be surrounded by another brother or sister in Christ, that we can pray for them, and Holy Spirit, that you would come upon them, giving them world-changing vision because we need it so bad, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you just come down here and...